All right, so today we're going to go over some of the highlights of Douglas MacArthur in World War I. Um, with that being said, I kind of, uh, this was his initial kind of claim to fame in terms of war in a way. So like he became, he was a colonel at the time and started commanding the 42nd Division, which is known as the uh, Rainbow Division. It was called this basically because it was a bunch of guard units from different states that they kind of mashed together and like a rainbow, right? So <clears throat> there's a bunch of different uh, colors in a way. But anyways, so to take a quote, so on October 19th, 1917 when Colonel Douglas MacArthur sailed from Hoboken aboard the Covington with elements of the 42nd Division he could by no means be sure that he would ever see land again basically because it was a dangerous voyage that's pretty much it um so to continue so censorship had not Sorry, censorship not yet having been imposed, MacArthur sent anguished cables to Washington and presently, presently influential senators and congressmen from states represented in the rainbow were demanding that the, that the division be kept intact. Basically, like they were thinking about breaking it up since it, it is from different states um, and so on, like different units and so on. They wanted to break it up believe that was something from uh, Pershing himself, perhaps. Um, yeah, something like that. There was a, we'll say, tiff between um, MacArthur and Pershing, especially in World War I, and we'll get into a direct example of that later. Um, but, yeah. However, um, Basically, he was able to keep the division together, and they, he became kind of your, uh, this is where he really started to get his start as a, we'll say, it, this is where his legend started, right? Um, his uh, kind of personality and how he kind of conducted himself, like actually under fire and that sort of thing. Um, stuff that he became even more famous for in World War II, um, being a, uh, you know, the full general and actually like uh, flipping over like Japanese snipers and stuff. Um, granted, they were already dead, but you know, still getting shot at even after all that time. Anyways, uh, an example of this uh, back in World War I. So he became so popular, in fact, that some doughboys were prepared to credit him with every propitious omen that greeted the 42nd, including two spectacular rainbows, one which arced across the sky when they left the Baccarat sector after four months of intensive training and trench warfare, and another which appeared when they attacked on the Orc River. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that, but basically he became very much... Um, Maybe not so much at this point in time, but especially later, he was kind of attri um, attributed to being a god for some people, um, just with his, I guess, aura or whatever, just the, his demeanor and how he carried himself and basically how he seemed to be uh, so powerful in a way, um, at least in that kind of sense. And so, yeah. There's that part. Um, so this was obviously World War One didn't go all wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for him because um, he he did end up getting gassed on uh, March 11th and so basically uh, and he was reported to be severely wounded but he basically didn't let this affect him at all um, to we'll say the uh, I guess discouragement of his mother and so on. She wasn't happy about it at all. Um, let's see if I take a quote. Yeah, and this was really when um, his mother was really starting to kind of do her work on Pershing himself to like kind of, you know, get her son a star, which is something you'll see 
quite a few times uh, with MacArthur and so on. Um, so to MacArthur, showing off was essential to charismatic leadership. He remarked that having a high-ranking officer bumped off uh, would be a great boost for doughboy morale. And when Fraser Hunt of the Chicago Tribune, noting that the left sleeve of his West Point sweater had been clipped by a machine gun bullet, asked how he justified his risks, MacArthur replied, well, there are times when even general officers have to be expendable. Right, so, and this is a general theme you see throughout his life entirely, is just, you know, kind of not being afraid to put himself in risky situations. Um, like I said earlier with like Japanese snipers and so on. Um, and even when he uh, tried to leave, he not tried, he did leave uh, Corregidor kind of under the direct order of FDR himself because he wouldn't leave. Um, we'll get into that later because it's further down in his life and so on. Um, so to continue on, so this was, uh, this is kind of a little, this is the tiff I was talking about with between him and Pershing. Um, so, and the general, in this case Pershing, unknown to the Colonel MacArthur, um, had adopted a practice of unbraiding, or, I'm sorry, upbraiding uh, field officer, field grade officers on the theory that it kept them on their toes. So basically he kind of, I wanna say like, he didn't corner MacArthur, but like in front of all of MacArthur's men and all of his troop himself of the Rainbow Division, um, Pershing basically just started yelling at him, saying that this, di to quote, uh, this division is a disgrace. The men are poorly disciplined and they are not properly trained. The whole outfit is just about the worst I have ever seen. They're, they're a filthy rabble. Uh, shocked, MacArthur stammered, generally these men have just come off the line. Pershing roared, young man, I don't like your attitude. Um, my humble apologies, sir, the colonel replied, but I only speak the truth. The general snapped, MacArthur, I'm going to hold you personally responsible for getting discipline and order into this division or God help the whole pack of you. And basically this was kind of when, um, oh, and MacArthur basically did the classic, like, you know, you're like, yes, sir, and just move on sort of thing. Um, but this was when MacArthur really started to believe that there was like this clique around Pershing that was always out to get him. And this was something you see he will refer to them as they a lot, like kind of they're out to get me in a way um, throughout pretty much his entire life. There's always been some form of clique higher up or in kind of like a different back in Washington, whatever, that was always kind of out to get him. Um, and what's funny is not so long after this, uh, Pershing is actually the one who pins MacArthur's first star and a disservice, uh, distinguished service medal on him too for, for World War I. So it's kind of a, yeah, there's that. Um, without getting, th these are kind of like highlights and stuff I came across that I wanted to say about, uh, World War I. So... Again, like um, most of this is coming from a book called uh, American Caesar, Douglas MacArthur, 1880 to 1964. This is by William Manchester. Here's the cover if you guys need. And basically what these videos are, I'm, I'm slowly kind of picking apart his life in a way and started going more in depth in individual people, making them into playlists and so on. So obviously this isn't going to be the only source I use. Um, so I'm gonna go back and do other things too and cross-reference and so on uh, later on. But this is kind of like just an initial run, see how it goes. But so with that being said, since, you know, can't really talk about all of World War I in less than 10 minutes. So if there's some, if you guys want more in depth, I can do that too. Just let me know in the comments below, uh, things like that. Um, maybe talk more about that, his actual, like, say, battle worthiness, something like that. I don't know. But anyways, I'm going to leave this one here. If you guys think I'm leaving anything out or have any comments or whatever, maybe it's not exactly what you're expecting, whatever it may be, um, put it in the comments below. And with that being said, these are all in playlists. Um, so 
are all, all are going to be in playlists. So the next one for basically the inner warriors is going to be up in the top right corner. So hope to see you guys on one of those.